This podcast is sponsored by the animation studio Tonic DNA. You're listening to the Story Driven Arts Podcast, where the visual arts and storytelling come together. I'm animation director and your host, Todd Schaefer. This is the second part of my conversation with the legendary painter, film designer, and now author, Armand Baltazar. Armand has written and illustrated a novel called Timeless, Diego and the Rangers of the Vast Atlantic. This is an achievement that is rare in the history of art and literature. The author-illustrator is a rare breed that is usually only found in children's literature. Armand stands alongside author-illustrators such as James Gurney and The Great Howard Pyle. Not only is Timeless a best-selling book, it's being produced as a film at Disney, and the executive producer on the film is Ridley Scott. In this episode, Armand talks about how Timeless came about, how it found a publisher, and how the film deal with Disney has come together. I studied under one of his students for in a workshop. His name was uh, Ovanis Barbarian. Yes, Sylvanas. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, all those guys, man. Yeah, Good I went stuff. up to Carpinteria to his workshops, and I think I went to right. two of them. I took two of them from him. But he yeah. was really into, heavily into that Russian impressionist colorist kind of style. Right. But, yeah, Sergei, Sergei Bongart. It's, it's cool because, you know, I don't paint like that anymore. I mean, I have a couple older pieces that look kind of Russian-ish, but the thing is just the just the training and the insight was just so was so valuable, you know? So you talked about the early American illustrators as well, and I have right. to tell you, they are my favorite artists. I think that their art is should be alongside all of the other artists in, in the world from, oh, yeah. you know, from history. Um, because like you said, Dean Cornwell, Mead Schaefer, Saul Tepper, uh, JC Lion Decker. Um, uh, I mean, I could go on and yeah. on with these guys. These are amazing, amazing <laughs> yeah. artists. And the fact that yeah. they did all this stuff under time pressure, you know, some of them had a week to get these paintings done and then shipped oh, yeah. to, to the uh, printers, you know? <laughs> oh man, we're spoiled. We really are, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, the thing is, too, is it, it's it's funny because I remember I did a couple oil paintings for clients and it was miserable. I remember I was stressing out like crazy because um, I had to go and get the my oil painting shot. Like I'd paint some of them really big and I'd go have to get them shot. I couldn't shoot them myself. I had to take them to a professional studio that had polarizing lights and polarizing cameras and to get the whole thing correct yeah. then get a transparency then fedex a transparency to new york you know blah 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 blah. it was like a 10-step process now it's like um i make a painting <laughs> i put in a dropbox or some other electronic thing and whoop, and send it you yeah. know like around the world it's like work up until the last minute i'm like but god those guys they were they they were they were true masters in yeah, every they... sense of the word they really were, and they they le- they earned their chops. Oh boy! <laughs> so yeah. so so you you've written and illustrated a book called Timeless, right? Um, and and the you, you sort of put yourself into a place in the history of art and literature where very few people have ever uh, achieved anything. You know, the right. author illustrator. And the only one I know of, uh, you know, only two of them that I know of is like James Gurney and Howard Pyle. Do you, right. do you ha- are there any others that you're aware of that you were inspired by? Yeah, there, there were. I mean, the um, James Gurney was probably at the top of my list of people who inspired the heck out of me. Um, before that, not quite the same thing as what what, I, what I'm doing now and what I've created but uh, N.C. Wyeth was a huge, huge yeah. influence on me mm-hmm. um, because he was one of the first – he was one of the – I mean, okay, that's just as an illustrator. He's not the writer. Right. But um, that, that got me into – his artwork got me into the stories. But to get more specific, um, it's more like contemporary guys, like um, uh, more like in children's books, like Tony DiTerlisi did the Spiderwick Chronicles who sort of, uh, he wrote and illustrated his own book. Uh, and then there are books like um, 
the um, by um, Rian Portvliet, the guy who did Gnomes. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, and so who did big, big illustrated books. He did, you know, and he's sort of Rian Portvliet done a series of books, and he's one of the guys that James Gurney will often refer to as one of the other fellow pioneers of this kind of thing, where he would write everything, but also heavily or profusely illustrate his tomes. But you're right, there are not too many. I mean, there are there are guys that are uh, making things that, that are adjacent to that, like um, uh, like graphic novel artists yes. who also write, you know. But that medium is a little bit different because it's it's comic book or graphic novel um, kind of art as opposed to like uh, completely painted panels or sequential storytelling, you know. Right. But um, you know, one of the things I found in doing this is that that number of people doing it is small for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can understand that. It's it's, uh, it's small for a reason. I mean, hey, let me back up a second. When I went to do this, let me I'll I'll give you just a um overview. When I started yeah. to do this, it I I started to do this as a little labor of love for my then 3 3 and a half year old son as a 20 page children's picture book. That's what it was going to be when I started. It was going to be a little wow. simple story uh, and 20 illustrations and, you know, very not not like what I what ended up being the artwork, if you've seen it, but something much more simple. And then what ended up happening was I got so busy working at Pixar that I put aside the book. And then one day my son came into my room and he was no longer three years old. He was like 11 going on 12. And he goes, Dad, you remember that book you started for me that you designed that really super cool robot for me? You know, in that story and I go yeah and he's like well you know what'd be great is if you finish that story for me wow and I'm like, oh my god you know <laughs> and and then I I sort of said you know what son I'm going to and this was right around the time of I finished up on Cars 2 I was working on Brave but I would be done in a few months on Brave and I was about to just dig back in and he and he looked at me and he goes but you know dad I'm going on 12 I don't think it should be like a children's picture book anymore you know and, and he was just like <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay, yeah, I, I get your point. Well, what do you have in mind? And so here's the thing. Now imagine this. I have an 11-year-old son. He's now like seen all the Harry Potter movies, read a bunch of the Harry Potter books. Yep. Star Wars, done that. Lord of the Rings, done yep. that. You know, I mean, he's full-on boy, you know, full-on adventure. He goes, Dad, it's got to be bigger. It's got to be a bigger adventure, you know? And it's got to have really cool illustrations, you know, like the stuff you do, you know, that you do, you know, when you're, I mean, not little – he didn't want little kids illustrations right. he like full on. Yeah. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. You know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know? And so <laughs> I started out writing something that would be kick ass. <laughs> so my son's request was dad, it's got to kick ass. I'm like, Oh yeah. God, don't talk like that in front of your mother. But okay. <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot. And so I started, I started thinking, yeah, I started thinking about all the things that I dug when I was 12 years old. And I was like, Oh, I'd like, pirate stories they're like oh i liked all this you know and, and i sat down and i was telling him about my stuff that i loved and i said well what do you like he goes dad you'll be awesome this is what would be awesome i would love a story where there was more than one giant robot so there was a bunch of them and you know what else would be awesome dad i go no what he goes world war ii airplanes those are so cool that'd be great so i'm like uh, okay and he goes and, and dinosaurs are awesome and all of a sudden he starts rattling off all this stuff he goes and samurais are super cool and oh, if my friends could be in it, that'd be great. And, he, and then he's, he's, he's telling me all these things that would be really cool in an adventure story. And he goes, oh, but you know the best thing of all? And he was really into Indiana Jones at the time. He goes, I want to be like Indiana Jones. I want to fight off Nazis in a story. I'm going, oh, my God. Hold on. Let me get this straight, son. You want <laughs> lots of giant robots. You want dinosaurs. You want samurais. You want World War II airplanes. You, you know, you want your friends in it. And you want to fight off the Nazis? I looked at him. I go, "You're my God, you're crazy!" And he looked at me. He's 12 now, and he goes, "What's the matter? You can't do it." <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh no, you did not challenge your dad." Oh my God! And he did, you know. And so that's incredible. Said, all right. Yeah, all right. I'll let me sit down. I'm going to come up with something. And so I said, "You just give me some time. And I'm going to come up with it." And so I, you know, the thing is that happened was I was being so overworked going from one movie with a hyper tough crunch to the next that I needed an outlet, you know, I needed an outlet yeah. of like having fun Yeah. because I got to the point where making artwork wasn't fun. 
You know, like the last thing I wanted to do after coming home from a long day in the studio or doing OT on the weekends was making the art. I just wanted to, you know, turn my brain off, you know, but yeah. um, my, my son's request gave me the, uh, gave me the excuse to be a kid, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. and not answer to anybody else. When I started the project, I only had one audience. I only had one art director. I only had one director I had to please. Yeah. Or maybe one, two. Myself one producer. And him. One producer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And all of a sudden it was like, it was fun, you know? And I'm like, hey, my son's name is Dylan. I go, what if we, what if we had this kind of dinosaur in the story? He's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But this is even better, Dad. Look at this one. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that is cool. All right. I'll, you know, and so it was that. I got to, it became this weird, sort of awesome bonding activity with my son to work on this thing and so i worked on it i started writing it and um at first i set out to make it like james gurney's dinotopia at about 15 to twenty thousand words with maybe total of 40 to 60 illustrations in it wow even uh, that's that was, ambitious that was, oh yeah i mean but the thing is i was like because it was a side project it, like i had no time limit on it i just knew i was going to work on it on the side you know um and then uh you know, so I started working on it, started working on it, and it was hard with um, with the way uh, my job was, you know, and so it started to slip again, and I put it away, and then, wait, should I give you the full story, or just the speech? Go, go for it. All right. Okay, the full story is, the full story is a little, it'll, it'll have some sad parts in it. Um, okay. Forewarning. All right. So, um, I was working on it for a while. Um all the way through Brave, and then I stopped because we got really busy with Brave. You know, I knew my son was bummed because he saw that I stopped working on the project. And then um, possibly one of the worst things that could have ever happened happened during Brave. Um, well, it was good and it was bad. It was bittersweet. I had a really good friend at Art Center. He was a term or two ahead of me, and we worked together on and off. Never worked on the same project. And we worked together at Disney at the same time. And I remember when I was on Princess and the Frog, I wanted to hire him. And he um, he turned me down. Well, I had a chance as an art director to sort of hire him onto my crew. And, he, and I asked him why. And he goes, I'm going to go follow my dream. I've been working in animation for a long time, but I want to be a different kind of visual storyteller. I want to direct. I'm going to go back to Art Center and learn how to be a director. And at the time, he was 45, and I thought he was crazy. But I supported him. And I said, yeah, you should go and do it. And so while I was working on Brave, I stayed in touch with my friend, and he had graduated, was graduating from Art Center with a second BFA in film. And he had sold a script and was going to film his very first movie as a director, ironically, to Disney. It was going to be a live action um, oh. film. So what ended up happening is my friend, his name is Kevin Wallace, was, he was an African-American uh, layout artist. He'd gone back to school and to be a director, and he wrote – a film about the first African-American animator at Disney. And he had sold the script and was going to direct it. And two weeks before he would have started on the project, he ended up, he was working as a second unit director on someone else's project. Uh, he, after he, coming off uh, late night of work, he ended up being struck uh, by a drunk driver and then he died several days later. Oh my gosh. And so I went down, in fact, took my family because they all, my son, my wife, we, we all knew him very well. We went down to his services and the whole service was about how this guy had, he had had this great career and had a dream and at 45 had gone back to go and chase his dream and was, you know, at the crest of making it happen. And, and the thing to take away was, you know, he, he died fulfilled. You know, he shouldn't have died, but he, right. he, he was a person who was on this journey and he was seeing it through. Wow. And I remember on the drive back to, to San Francisco area, I couldn't stop thinking about what my friend had done, you know, and what a great thing. And, and um, I looked at my son and said, you know what? I set out to do this thing. I've always wanted to write my own book and illustrate it. And I told my son I was going to do it. And so when I got back from that event, I finished up Brave, went into um, Inside Out. Actually, I went on another project for a little bit and then went on to Inside Out. And I started uh, carving out time to just do my book um, on that. I wanted to sort of follow in the footsteps of my friend and just try and see something through. 
mm-hmm. that was a labor of love. So, um, so I started working on it, uh, and then I ended up um, deciding to show the book in progress to people to sort of keep the momentum going. And you know, Sarah was sending me to different events like San Diego Comic Con to review uh, portfolios or do talks. You know, they there'd always be people talking and helping to promote the films. And I had friends who had tables at San Diego Comic Con, and um, you know, they had their own comic books and their own little side projects. And um, I realized that if I was going to get my book done, I might need to do a Kickstarter and get it self-published. I didn't even think about going to a big publisher. I was just like, it was going to be my little labor of love. And so one of my friends was like, look, go to San Diego Comic-Con. You're going to be there anyways for helping promote Pixar stuff and show some of your work and tell people about your story so that when you start a Kickstarter, people will be really aware of it, you know? Yeah. So I went down. I brought a bunch of artwork from the book and I typed up a one sheet about what it was all about. And I ended up being, uh, well, long story short, I ended up going down and, um, ended up being spotted by 20th century Fox and, and several different other publishers who got really interested <laughs> wow. in the story. And so they, I got asked by both Fox and by different publishers to sort of uh, submit my, my manuscript. And I did. And it ended up getting picked up by um, HarperCollins Publishing and by 20th Century Fox. And so HarperCollins offered me a uh, series deal for three books. And if they went well, to do the entire series, which is currently six books. And so oh, wow. um, I so started timeless working. Is your first, is timeless is your first one. And you're working on the second one now? Yeah, right now I'm in the middle. I'm right in the middle of production on book two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So the thing is, is that <clears throat> when I signed on with them, they sort of looked at the book and they sort of wanted to do something that hadn't been done. When, no, let me back up. At first they thought, well, let's just do this the way books are normally done uh, because they really like my story a lot. And they said, okay, so you're going to write, you're going to write a book and then you can make a really cool, awesome illustration for the cover of the book, you know, and maybe a couple little spot illustrations at each chapter and that'll be the book. And I said, but, what about all these paintings I've already painted? And they said, oh, yeah, they're amazing. They're absolutely stunning. That's part of what drew us to wanting to look at the story and read it. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a waste if, they don't, if they're not in the book. So at first, they asked me, well, what do you have in mind? And I said, well, I want to be like James Gurney, <laughs> make a, a book like that. And I said, yeah, but you didn't write a book like James Gurney. You wrote something that's um, like the size of Harry Potter 1. Yeah. And um, – it was, you know, it was a lot of text, like a lot of text. Um, and they said, you know, and so that would be, a, if we did it like that, it would be a very, very big, expensive book. And you're a first time author, I don't know if you want to take that chance. And so I said, uh, okay, well, I don't know if I want to do a book where I can't put in the artwork that I've made and want to make for it in it. And so Harper came back and said, well, look, we have another idea. And they asked me if I'd seen the book, uh, The Invention of Hugo Cabret. And have you seen that book? I have not. It's um, it's the book that Martin Scorsese made his movie Hugo from. Oh, yes. yes it's okay. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting in it, it's a book like my, like Timeless. I mean, things like five, 600 pages. But there's like 200 pages of illustrations in it. Now, and, and they're beautiful. And yeah. with Hugo, it's they're pencil drawings, you know, sort of illustrations and they're right. gorgeous. And they said, well, we would be interested in making a book like that, that had a ton of artwork in it. Um, but your artwork, would you be interested in that? And so I sort of said, so my choices are either make a book with a single piece of artwork or, you know, with a couple little things inside or make a book. That's a lot of artwork kind of thing. So it'd be like in that category of things that aren't done too often or hardly ever. And so I took the ladder and um, started, you know, <laughs> started finishing up the writing and started just generating tons of artwork for Timeless. Wow. So how many illustrations did you end up doing for Timeless total? There was around 200. Incredible. Incre- no wonder it took you so long. <laughs> how, how, oh, long how long did it take you to do this? It, t- it took about four years total. I oh, mean, that's not from- too bad. Well, 
that's of actual production. If I gave you the, the actual timeline, like when I first started the first draft as a 20 page picture book, it would be like a 10 year process. Okay. But, um, four years were when I finally got serious. And what had happened was when I wrote timeless for my son, the draft I wrote was ridiculous. Um, when I say ridiculous, what I mean is that I wrote it with the idea that this was going to be a self-published book, you know, and I started, I kind of wrote it like one of my childhood favorite books, which was Dune. Mm. I don't know if you've read, ever read Dune. Yes, I have. Dune, yeah. I think it's like a 1200 page book. I know it's, <laughs> it's monstrous. Like a, and I was like, <laughs> so I wrote, I wrote this big, it was even, even bigger and more epic. <clears throat> and they sort of looked at my manuscript and they go, you know, we want to make this, we think that the story you've written uh, and the way you've written it fits really squarely as a middle grade book, not as an adult fiction book, uh, science fiction book. Uh-huh. And he goes, and I said, okay, well, you know, the thing is, is that I wrote the character is 13 years old. His friends are like 13, 14 years old kind of thing. And um, in the series, the series is similar to Potter in that each book, the kids get a year older. Yeah, which sort of fits more as like, you know, like Harry Potter is kind of a book that goes from being a middle grade book to young adult, because by the time when he's like 17 and 18, in the last couple of books, you know, there's more adult issues, you know, romance right. and death and fighting and battles and all sort of stuff. Not that there isn't battles and things before, but it gets you know deadly serious. And my 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 characters go on a similar path of maturity in theirs, and so they go. So they came back and said, that makes more sense as middle grade. I'm like, I saw their point. And then they came back and said, well, usually a middle grade book is between 60 to 70,000 words. You have a book that's 180,000 words. You have enough for three books. Wow. And so um, my choice was either to break it into three books or try and rewrite it. So I took the path of rewriting it. So I spent a year and a half rewriting the book to try to get it down to – I compromised. I said, I I can't get it to 60,000 words, but I I think I can get it to the size of the first Harry Potter. It was around 98. And Timeless is about 120,000 words. Wow. In the end. Um, But um, so so it took a year and a half to write and then about a year and a half to illustrate. Okay. So you did the writing first and then you did the illustration or did you do them in tandem? I did them in tandem, but like when I'm writing, I didn't take anything further than like sketching okay you know uh kind of like i wasn't taking anything to full paint because everything was kind of malleable and then there's a real sort of process to um the book which is a little bit different because there was going to be so many illustrations um the illustrations had to go there was a certain amount of illustrations you could do that had to fall in the right places um without getting hyper technical about publishing it's sort of like if you're making a movie you know you're either going to be making a movie as a 90 minute movie or a two hour movie you know what i mean you have these sort of set sort of things yeah and so i had a book that we were trying to hit no more than 600 pages (laughs) wow (laughs) you know and so when you put in illustrations you got to move you have to like move text around you know but if you only know it's kind of like being bumped into a 90 minute film and you have like 10 sequences and you only have enough room for six <laughs> sequences. You got to figure out how to trim and move things around. I ended up having to do that. So I'd make artwork and then find out, Oh man, you know, I have to take out art or I have to rewrite sequences, you know, when I, when I pulled artwork out. So it was this sort of shifting kind of landscape uh, as, as I was working on it. Well, wow. So you've basically written the entire series They've just broken it into six different books? No, no. I wrote book one. Um, what I ended up doing was I sort of just took stuff that was in the very first draft. A lot of it, thank God, I got cut, cut off that it was like wasn't really – didn't need to be there. You know, like when you first write, like, oh, yeah, this is important. But yeah. I kept the things that were important and sort of moved them around. But I only had written – you know, had worked out the story for book one and then, um, you know, what I had done though was I had written an outline for books two through six, okay. and I submitted those with the draft, so they could see where I had, where I was going with the entire series. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, so when I started working on book two, 
what I'll say is that it keeps to the gist of the dra of the outline that I, I created, the very first outline um, version of book two. But things evolve because over a period of time, you change as a person as you grow older. You know, right. different different things become important to you. <laughs> right. You know, no, that's for sure. Well, that's incredible, Armand, that, that, you know, you just sort of worked in there. I think if do you think that if back when you started first thinking about it, that it would go to publishing that that would have maybe uh, brought a little bit of fear into your work and maybe hesitation. Whereas what actually happened was you were doing it for yourself. It was really not going to go anywhere. So you just felt free to do whatever you wanted and not think about it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's how, I mean, that's how it ended up, but I think that is exactly what it was. And let me kind of, I'll share with you this other thing before Timeless, I had tried writing and illustrating a book two other times. Oh, okay. Um, the first time while I was still at um, DreamWorks on working on uh, Sinbad, I had started writing like a fantasy novel in my head um, and then making the artwork for it. Okay. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that I never had a strong enough story. I'd fallen in love with making the art, but not the storytelling process. Right. And by the end of the day, I had 70 paintings or, or drawings and paintings that were, you know, uh, I was really proud of and really happy about. But when I had to sit down and tell somebody the story about what it was, I couldn't I couldn't stand in front of another person and tell you exactly what the story was in a compelling way that made you go, oh, my gosh, I need to know. I need to read the story. I right. need to see the story, you know. Right. And so I realized, oh, my gosh, I did all this artwork, but without story, it's meaningless if your intention was to make a story with great art. You know? Right. No, I understand. So this is in your blood to, to write and illustrate. Yeah, I think so. God, I feel like it's a blessing and a curse, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. I tell people this because, you know, when I told you back before that there's very few people who do like this kind of book. Yeah. And it's, it's because if you only had to write a good story, that would be a tough Herculean task. Exactly. To do, right. Yeah. If you, if you only had to be an awesome illustrator to profusely illustrate a story, and not even yeah. saying it's your own, but just someone else's story even. And yeah. like, oh, I'm going to do 200 paintings for somebody else's story. Like the way you would do 200 paintings for uh, animation, right? Yeah. It would be a Herculean task. Well, it Either is. One of them on, yeah, it is, man. And then to say, you know what? I'm going to do both. I'm going to be my own writer, director, you know, my own critic. I, I have to be a critic of my own writing. I have to be a critic of my own art. I have to, you know what I mean? It's like it's like double duty, man. You go like doubly insane. Yeah, uh, there, sleep... There's some insanity uh, in your brain somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't tell you of losing. When I was only an artist, I don't ever remember losing any hours of sleep over crafting three or four sentences together in a way that are meaningful. You know, yeah. I mean, I would have that about like, God, why is my color harmony correct? Why is my composition off? I would have those sleepless nights. And then you pair that with, God, why is my composition off? Why is my car color harmony not correct? Why would the character say that? He wouldn't say that. <laughs> maybe he would say this, or maybe he would say that. Which way is the way he would say something? You know, so I'm like, it's it's like I have multiple heads in my. It's no one had prepared me for that. You know, other than there's that old saying, right? Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, because you might get it. That's right. Well, maybe the best thing that happened was the fact that when I was just doing it for me and my son, it was just kind of like I gave myself permission to fail. You yeah. know what I mean? Like just have fun. Have That's fun. so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. If, and, you, um, if you if you're not afraid to fail, then you're not you're not going to be doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> you got to let yourself fail. Well, you know, the thing is, when I go and talk to kids, I say one of the things I always tell them is that um, thank, thank God for the failures, because each one was that step closer to succeeding. Yeah, it was actually a stumble forward. You yeah. know, it was a stumble, not a step. It was a stumble. But, yeah. you know, it's kind of like like, you know, finding the right line when you're drawing something. You right. Know? You, know, you got to find it. You you're either it by putting them down. You know? If you're not a genius, you're going to fail. And none of us are geniuses. There's only a few geniuses. So all the failures build stepping stones. It's your foundation. And the more you can fail, you know, the more stepping stones you have to actually achieving something that's really good. And 
And what you've done, you know, I mean, you, if you've written two stories and illustrated two stories beforehand, you know, those were the stepping stones to get you to the place where you could do timeless and put it in the position that it is. Did, right. uh, did you do any uh, writing training or anything like that in your, in your, your studies? You know, when I was a, when I was a kid, I loved to write. I used to love to write. I used to read books. I remember when I was in, in grade school, we and in high school, they had all the books we were supposed to read, and I read them. And I, to be honest, I hated most of them. <laughs> <laughs> like the me great too. American classics you're supposed to love. Yeah, me too. I didn't like them. I wanted to read the stuff that I wasn't supposed to like. Yeah. You know, like um, like okay, we're gonna read Catcher in the Rye, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds good, but I'd rather read. Salem's Lot by Stephen King. Can I read that? Or can I, how about a graphic novel about Wolverine? You know, I mean, that's what I wanted to read. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's I mean? right. And so the thing is, um, and it, I did read the stuff I was supposed to read, but the thing is, is I wanted things that stimulated my imagination. Yeah. You know, and because and I was so visual, I, I um, what do you call it? I, uh, I sort of was moved towards the things that made my imagination fire off visually, you know? Right. And so, and I like creative writing, fiction writing. And so when I was in school, I had a creative writing class and I took that as much as I took art classes. Cause I wanted to write, I wanted to write my own horror stories. I wanted to be Stephen King. I wanted to be Michael Crichton, you know, kind of thing. I want, I want these pulpy kind of adventures. And so I used to write those, you know, and I won some awards doing writing and I won awards doing art. And what ended up happening in high school was I had a great writing teacher and a great art teacher. And both of them were saying, look, if you're going to get anywhere in life, you got to be really, really good at something. And I suggest focusing. So I had an art teacher saying, focus on art, you know, be great at that. And then I had a writing teacher like, focus on writing, be great at that. And so the thing is, I didn't, it never occurred to me that, you know, there's no reason you can't pursue both. Right. I mean, they're comic book artists that do that all the time, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I got where my teachers were coming from. And when it came down to it, at the end of the day, if it had to be one or the other, um, what I liked about art was it was so immediate failures and the successes. You know, you you put it down, you start making something, and it's happening right in front of you. Right. You know, and um, when it was when I was writing, it was different because it was a lot of being alone. <laughs> yes. And then I'd reveal it to somebody, you know, and then like it kind of felt like you you were like you know like you were jumping into a pool naked every time you showed some of your story. Oh, totally. But, was your, but when you're drawing, it's like you're seeing that you're failing or you're succeeding as it's happening, yeah. you know, kind of thing. And so I like the immediacy of that. I mean, I love them both, but some, for some reason I put it aside. And then when I went to college to do advertising, I was just so miserable that I couldn't even do the artwork I like that I didn't even think about writing. And then when I got to art center, I was like, I'm going to do books. And then the idea started kicking around in my head that I could write my own stories and illustrate my own books. But I just so focused on being such a good visual storyteller that I always said, I'll do it later. I'll do it. You know, I'll do it next year. I'll do it next year. I'll do it next year. You know? And then when I got the courage to do it, when I was at DreamWorks, I didn't spend enough time on the writing. I'd gotten so enamored that I was finally able to draw something that didn't suck. <laughs> you know, I wanted to do a lot of that, you know, and then yeah. I would just write, uh, here's a paragraph. Uh, the hero goes into this room, fights a bunch of dudes. Here's what it looks like. Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. But I never stopped and go, well, why do I care about what the hero doing this now? Like, yeah. And then I'll tell you about the second time I tried it. I tried it again when I worked for Robert Zemeckis. I was working with a whole bunch of the Skywalker Ranch and ILM guys. And um, they had also had yearnings to do an illustrated book. And so there's four or five of us. We decided, hey, let's do this let's not worry about writing a story. Let's just take a story that's in public domain and we'll illustrate the hell out of it, you know, and, and we'll get it published and make that our book, like self-published. So yeah. we picked uh, we picked Jason and the Argonauts, like Greek mythology. Cool. And we all started illustrating that, you know, and I think I've got a couple pieces of my Jason stuff up on Instagram or in Facebook or someplace. And here's the thing. Um, when you actually go to the actual story of Jason and the Argonauts, Whenever you say Jason the Argonauts, the first thing that comes in your head is Ray Harryhausen and the awesome <laughs> movie that he made, right? I mean, yeah. and the Sinbad movies that Ray Harryhausen made. And you know what? They were great. They were wonderful, awesome part of childhood experience. Yeah. Then you go crack open a Greek mythology book and you start reading about Jason and the Argonauts. 
and you realize that Jason is a jerk. <laughs> he's a, they, they changed everything for the Hollywood movie. He ends up yeah. being this. It's more like Game of Thrones. He's a selfish jerk, you know, who screws over a whole bunch of people in his ambition to become king. Yeah, wow. more so, so much so that yes, he gets the golden fleece, but he has destroyed kingdoms and people and and stuff. And one, like this this girl who in the movie falls in love with him, saves his life. You know, he betrays her. You know, he he has a kid with her, leaves him. He's a deadbeat dad. You know, and then in the end, the gods are so mad that he's turned out so horrible as a human being that he's an old man sitting beneath the uh, Argo, his ship, and um. Is it? It's wait. It's Zeus. Yeah, Zeus is so mad at him. He sends a bolt of lightning down, cracks the cracks the uh, masthead of the ship, and it falls down and cracks Jason's neck, killing him. Wow. Because he ended up being a miserable person. And I remember, <laughs> I'm going, and I was sitting there, and we read this, and we're like, yeah, well, we just care about the visuals. And I'm like, all of us who were working on it, like, well, if we actually do the real story, isn't you know that was the it was like Greek tragedy. Yeah, he had flaw. He was flawed. He ended up never becoming really a king or really a leader because he was too selfish and he wasn't a good enough person. Now, of course, Hollywood's not going to want that movie, especially yeah. not in the fifties. You know, no, they no. want some squeaky clean guy who's doing good yeah. stuff. You know, so I stopped working on it. The rest of the guys stopped working on it because, like, we none of us. I didn't. I didn't like the character. I didn't care. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. I, I want to. If I'm going to give up sweat and blood on weekends and right. evenings. I want it to be a story I care about. Otherwise, yeah. I mean, we all have worked on projects we didn't like. We didn't think we're very good. But at least we're being paid as professionals to do that. Yeah. If I'm doing something for free on my own time and my own dime, <laughs> I better love it, man. Otherwise, <laughs> what's the point in doing it, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a lesson. Yeah. Uh, who, I, yeah. I had no idea Jason was such a, a nasty character in the in the mythology. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, he's just flawed. You know, he's just yeah. selfish, and you know, but neither did I. That was a that was a, that was, that burst my bubble pretty well. Yeah, no doubt. So then you decided to write your own. So how how well has T Timeless done in its first uh, release? It's been doing really well. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, we are Timeless is in sixteen territories. I'm not exactly sure what that means. I know I should. <laughs> but we are in at least, I think we're in at least 17 different languages and 42 countries wow. worldwide. So uh, recently we just got uh, Israel. We landed China. We're in Germany, Italy, France, Spain, um, the Czech Republic, Russia, uh, Korea, wow. South Korea. And we're, so it's, it's doing really, really well. Uh, I just won the, um, I can't pronounce it very well. So it's the, it's it's an award in France um, for uh, a really famous book festival. Um, hold on here, let me look up what it is. So I don't completely butcher it. Uh, the name. <laughs> um, it is called. Okay, uh, the Grand Prix de l'Imaginaire, uh, which is the great prize of imagination for foreign grade novel at the. Um, Festival for the Etonan Voyager in France. So wow. this is um, this award is like given has been given to guys in the past like Jules Verne and to H. G. Wells, and it's you know quite an honor to be that's fantastic to, to be sort of awarded with some other authors in this category. You know, and so and congratulations, um, thank you. And I'm going to Italy in a few in October to do a uh, retrospective of the timeless work. Uh, at the uh, Luca Comics and Game Festival, which is Europe's version of like San Diego Comic Con, so mm. that's pretty cool. And um, it's it's done it's it's done very well. I, I can't. I feel when you're hearing my voice is like kind of shock and awe <laughs> that I sort of started this thing off as this guy who was working in animation, writing this little story for my kid, and it's kind of become this thing. Um, which has been really cool. It's been really cool. Yeah. So, so uh, is the movie in the works? It is. And then it's had its own interesting journey. So when the, what had sort of happened was Fox had seen the story and the artwork that I was showing in Comic-Con and they were very, very interested in it. 
And the thing is, is that um, they wanted to option the story and I turned them down initially, originally. And I said, look, I'm really flattered that you want to make a movie out of my story. But um, the thing is, the book is not done. And if I option my story to you, you, you could sit on it for as long as 10 years and I can't tell you. And they said, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. And I go, I mean, you, you might make it a movie or you might not, but you can sit on it for that time as long as you keep paying the option to do so. And I wanted to make sure that I'd set out to make this book, you know, for my son and, and from that experience I had with my friend's death. And I was determined to make this book. And I said, I'm going to pass on it for its film potential, at least with Fox for now. And I said, look, don't say no to us. Basically, you're saying that you want to make your book. And they said, if you get to make your book, you'd consider talking to us again. And I said, yes. And so um, we left it at that. You know, I just kept working on the book. Uh, HarperCollins picked it up. HarperCollins just happens to be the sister company of 20th Century Fox at the time. And um, HarperCollins offered me the contract. And the day that I agreed to HarperCollins, I got a phone call from Fox. Wow. <laughs> so you got the book deal you always wanted. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. And he goes, well, would you be interested in talking to us now? And I said, yes, I would. <laughs> and so um, we worked on it. Uh, it got, it ended up asking me if I would allow Fox to, to show it to some of their directors. And I was really fortunate that um, the first two directors they showed it to were working on a project together. It was Ridley Scott and Carlos Saldana. Oh my Carlos goodness. Saldana is the director of, you know, of uh, Ferdinand the Bull, uh, some of the Ice Age movies and the Rio films and uh, at Blue Sky. And he was working on a live action sci-fi film with Ridley Scott. And um, the timeless manuscript and our package got sent to Ridley and to Carlos. And they basically, they loved it. And they contacted me and said they wanted to do it. And so wow. I said, yes. And so we were, we've been working on Timeless to be made as a live action film like Harry Potter or Star Wars, the 20th Century Fox. Uh, we were closing in on um, the final script for it. Everything was looking good. And then Disney bought Fox. Oh, no. Um, well, no, so far it has a continuing uh, happy ending or not ha ha continuing happy state of affairs. What ended up happening was Disney uh, bought Fox. They looked at all the projects Fox had, and Timeless was um, – they liked it a lot. <laughs> Long oh. story short, they liked it a lot, and it is now at Disney with the same – with Ridley and okay. Carlos. And now we are developing the script. So there's – now we're developing a new script for Disney. Um, and uh, Are you, you involved know, in the writing of that? I'm involved as an executive producer. Okay. So. What that means is basically I'm sort of a story and visual consultant. I get a, I, you know, I sort of working with the producers on trying to shape the script. Ultimately, it's going to be Ridley and the director, which is Carlos. <laughs> Ridley is going to be the executive producer. Carlos is going to be the director. And, um, you know, basically I have, uh, I have a say in it, but I am not writing it. So we oh, have okay. a different, we have, we have somebody else who's adapting the book and I'm sort of giving my, my notes on what I think. Wow, that's fantastic, Armand.